DNA replication is not for the weak at heart. But hopefully at this point, you're like, we kind of think it might be important to be able to make copies of DNA. And I would go back, except I probably would make you seasick, to our first diagram of the human life cycle. And remember, we went from zygote to 100 trillion cells. We, I'm gonna write that down. We went from one cell, and that was the zygote, to 100 trillion cells, and that was the grown up. And each cell has 46 chromosomes of DNA. Each cell has 46 pieces, molecules, of this double-stranded DNA. Each, okay, let's, this is what's in one cell. That, the amount of DNA in there is 6 billion base pairs. Oh my Lord, are you kidding me? 6 billion base pairs divided up in those various chromosomes. For perspective, not everybody's genome is the same size. We have six billion base pairs. The marbled lungfish has the biggest genome that we've discovered, and it has 133 billion base pairs in every single cell. This is just mind blowing. Six billion base pairs every time a cell divides. Six billion base pairs have to be copied. And that process is DNA replication. And in humans, for us, this whole process, one cell, it takes eight to 10 hours to copy all the DNA. I mean, yes, that it should take a long time to make a copy of all of the DNA. And that copying of the DNA has to happen before the cell can divide. So that we make sure that each daughter cell, each cell that results, has the complete set. Boy, if you're going to make a copy, like if you had to copy a book that had six billion words in it, oh my lord, and you had to, would you make any mistakes? Well, maybe I should ask you, do you think I would make any mistakes? <laughs> I can't, like, I can't even say the words right when I'm giving these lectures to you. So yes, I would make mistakes. Your cells, the process of DNA replication makes about one, oh man, one mistake. I knew I had this fact somewhere, per billion base pairs. So that means every time we copy our DNA, we're going to have six base pairs that are different from what we had in the beginning. We will learn as we start talking about DNA function, we will learn what the significance of that. That's actually those mistakes. Those are mutations. And gloriously, Mutations often don't even matter, and we will see why that is the case. How many molecules, how complicated do you think this process is to produce an entire copy of all of these chromosomes? It's a complicated process, and it happens in a method, I don't know what this is, but it, it, that process is called semi-conservative. replication. And man, there are so many cool studies that they did to figure this stuff out. So it would be an awesome application task for you to check out the study. I think it was Stahl. Um, someone in Stahl did this. Messelson and Stahl 
figured out that DNA replication is semi-conservative and you probably are going, dude, what does that even mean? Well, if you imagine, here's a double strand of DNA, right? Semi-conservative replication means that the strand separates so that new nucleotides are added, like half of each new strand is new nucleotides and the other half is the old original nucleotides. The alternative would be like conservative DNA would look like this, where somehow we went from that to, oh my gracious, this. Okay, sorry for my DNA drawings, but you get the idea that this would be conservative. And then there is a, a proposal of dispersive replication where you basically took one strand of DNA and your two resulting strands were like a mishmash of new DNA and old DNA. Not the case. What they figured out is that it actually is semi-conservative replication and you end up, it makes sense, right? Because if you split the DNA apart and you now have an adenine exposed on one side and a thymine exposed on the other, when you add a thymine to this side and an adenine to this side, the two molecules that you create are identical. It's a, it's, how often am I, is my mind like blown? It happens all the time. Okay, so let's talk about um, the enzymes that are involved in this process. And um, I'm gonna make a list of them on this page that this, on this diagram that shows you, it's just nicer than my diagrams. Notice that this is my original DNA double strand. It separates out and we end up with two new strands being formed. And you can actually see like, oh my God, that totally makes sense that we have these nucleotides that are just getting added. There are a bunch of enzymes that are involved in this process and I'm gonna list them out and tell you what their jobs are. The first enzyme to get involved is an enzyme called helicase. And basically helicase goes in and unzips the DNA. And that means like you can imagine breaking, if you're unzipping the DNA, you're breaking the hydrogen bonds that connect the nitrogen bases. So helicase goes in and does that work. There's another guy, now helicase is he, there. Helicase is being shown by this like triangle in our diagram, unzipping the DNA. At the same time, we have a buddy named topoisomerase. Well, I guess I'm not gonna write topoisomerase for you. Can you see that well enough? Topoisomerase is a molecule that, like imagine this, if you, I know you've done this because I totally have done this. When you try to unravel a piece of rope, why have I done this? I don't know, but I definitely have. When you try to like separate out the strands of rope or yarn, if you just separate it, you get like, it overwinds. It's called super coiling that happens above. Like somehow you have to release the pressure and you can either let the whole thing spin and that can let you continue unwinding your rope or you end up with a super coiled mess up high and unraveled yarn down low. Does that, do you, did I just confuse the crap out of you? Topoisomerase prevents super coiling. So that, we don't have to worry about that happening. Um, we do end up with these little binding proteins and these guys keep the two strands from popping back together because they want to. It's cozier for DNA molecules to exist in a, um, in a double helix. And so you can imagine all of this, all these enzymes doing this work, they're gonna need energy to make it happen, which means we need cellular respiration to be taking place. Okay, 
The majority of the work is done by an enzyme called DNA polymerase. And I probably, I'm going to, this is it right here. And you'll notice that there's one on each strand. And the molecules totally, like these enzymes divide and conquer. When they get the message that it's time to replicate the DNA, they start like replicating anywhere that they can find. They have many DNA polymerases that are getting after it and doing the job. They're all working together. And it still takes eight to 10 hours to do the whole thing. DNA polymerase is the main dog who does the building, adding in the nucleotides, and it builds a new strand in the five prime to three prime direction. So the new strand is the new piece of DNA is being built in the five prime to three prime direction, which means you have a, a one of your strands, when you open it up, one of them is just gonna zip along. DNA polymerase is just gonna go and be moving in the five prime to three prime direction and building new, new molecules. So behind them is growing five prime to three prime strand. The other side is going to have to work backwards. Can you visualize this? Because the way, and you can see this here, we have the lagging strand is the one that goes slower. The leading strand, we can just zip along and make it happen. The lagging strand means that we end up building fragmentally. We produce these fragments on the lagging strand, and they're called Okazaki fragments. Do you see that? I'll blow it up so you can see it really clearly, and I'll erase my little line so that you know that's an O. That's Okazaki. Okazaki was named after a scientist and his wife who figured this out, those fragments. Um, and so this brings in another... Um, enzyme that we're going to need. Those fragments need to be put back together again. And the enzyme ligase, um, what seals, connects, connects Okazaki fragments. There's somebody else. There's somebody else, folks. Primase. This is super interesting. DNA polymerase can't go unless there is an RNA primer laid down first. So the whole thing isn't going to happen unless we lay down an RNA primer and primase does that. I think what you'll find is that the, the names of the enzymes match their functions. So it, it isn't DNA primase is going to lay down primers that will allow the whole thing to get started because here's the fact that DNA polymerase can't function unless it has an RNA primer to start with. Next up, if you're looking at this going like that, then don't worry because what we're going to do next is we're going to walk through another rig style animation of this whole process where we'll see the molecule of DNA, we'll separate it out, we'll watch DNA, we'll watch helicase do that work, we'll watch the DNA polymerase bring in the nucleotides and add new nucleotides, we'll watch the lagging strand get the pieces put together, we'll watch the primase lay down the RNA primers and we'll see it all in, um, in order. Someone removes the primers, the RNA primers, and I can't remember who does that. Okay, are you ready to go do some animation? I am.